interesting is, you know, the moon is covered in craters and the earth is not. And uh, if you'll think about it for a second, that kind of doesn't make sense, right? Uh, what do, do all the things that snack into the moon miss the earth? Um, and the answer is, if you think about it, uh, is that uh, there's something that protects the earth from chunks of rock, mostly chunks of asteroid and stuff. Yes? Oh, mute. Okay, thank you, Irene. Uh, okay, so it's the, uh, it's the atmosphere that protects the Earth. Um, what we call falling stars are actually chunks of rock, uh, small to large, mostly small. Large ones make more spectacular things. And even when a large chunk of asteroid or other debris punches through our atmosphere, it actually reaches the surface of the Earth. We have things like wind and water and continental drift that erase craters from the surface of the Earth. The moon doesn't have any of that. So every uh, crater that has been on the moon for millions of years is still visible. So going through the requirements, sketch the face of the moon with the seas and craters. Uh, use a diagram from your merit badge book or feel free to get one online. Uh, and fill that in. 6B uh, is you're going to be sketching the moon four nights in a row and showing its different positions and its phase. So I've got a little diagram on there that is the same one from your merit badge book which explains why the moon has phases. Now the phases are like full moon, you know, waxing first quarter and full and then it cycles back around. So as the moon rotates around that elliptical, you know, around the earth, you can see the sunlight coming in from the right. So when the moon is new, all the sunlight's on the other side of the moon, so we don't see anything. That's called a new moon. When the moon is all the way on the other side of the earth from the sun, uh, the entire face is lit up and you see a, a complete circle. That's called a full moon. As it cycles from new to first quarter, you know, it waxes. waxes waxing means it gets bigger a waxing crescent first quarter, and then a waxing gibbous to full. Then it comes back around towards the sun. Waning means getting smaller. So a waning gibbous moon, a third quarter, then the waxing crescent, and then back to new moon. It does that every 29 days. So uh, that's 6B, sketch the phase and daily position for four days. Mr. Thompson. Uh, so 6C. When is what factors keep the moon in orbit around the Earth. Um, so the moon is moving really, really fast. And you would think, well, why doesn't it just fly off into space? It's not attached to the Earth by some invisible, invisible bungee cord. Uh, what, what force is keeping the moon and its speed from just flying off into outer space? Uh, and I think you guys already probably know the answer to this, but the first factor that keeps the moon in orbit around the earth is gravity. The same thing that uh, causes you to fall to earth when you jump up. The earth has a large gravitational field and the moon has a large but smaller gravitational field and gravity pulls matter towards matter. So big objects like the earth and the moon, when they're near each other, uh, you know, they're pulled together. So you're like, okay, Greg, if there's all this gravity pulling the moon towards the earth, why doesn't the moon just crash into the earth, you know, spiral in and hit it? Well, the answer to that is the other factor, which is what we mentioned, is the moon is moving really fast. So if you think about it, if you tied a baseball to the end of a string and spun it around, you would feel a force tugging on that string. Uh, the, the vector of the moon is away from the Earth, and so the two factors are gravity and motion, and they're perfectly balanced to keep the moon almost right where it is. It, it, very, it changes very little, and so uh, the same two factors, gravity and motion, uh, are what keep the Earth in motion around the sun and the solar system in motion uh, in, in the Milky Way and the moon in motion around the Earth. Uh, so that's 6C, what factors keep the moon in orbit around the Earth. This is true for satellites and uh, the space station and anything that's uh, 
orbiting something else. When something's orbiting something, the two uh, uh, forces are in perfect balance, right? Uh, if you sped up the moon enough, it would just fly off into space. If you increase the force of gravity, it would spiral in and crash. So they're perfectly balanced to keep the moon circling around and around and around. And there's nothing to slow it down, right? Here on Earth, we have atmosphere. And if you had something spinning around something else, it would slow down. If you throw a baseball, it slows down pretty fast because of, uh, uh, you know, resistance to the air. And, you know, if you put your hand outside the window of a moving car, you can feel that resistance. When you get out away from the Earth's atmosphere into outer space, there is no atmosphere to slow things down. So if you fire a bullet away from the Earth out into space, it's just going to keep going forever at the same speed until it encounters some other object. Um, so that's gravity and motion are the so two. So it's factors. like stuck in a free fall? Yes, essentially that's correct. If you get away from a gravitational field uh, out beyond the Earth, uh, you experience essentially a condition where there's no up. Uh, every direction is up or down. It's called free fall. And when you see uh, astronauts floating around in a, in a capsule, they're in that state. They're, they're not being pulled towards the Earth fast enough to feel. So they, they, it, it, you just float. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so that should be 6C. 6D is that same diagram that I have on the screen as in your merit badge book. Uh, so just fill in uh, those eight boxes on what the different phases are on the relative uh, position. So obviously when the moon is between the earth and the sun, that's a new moon. When the earth is between the uh, sun and the moon, that's huh? a full moon. And you can fill in the others from there. What? Um, Got it? Okay, so we're going to move on. The sun is number seven. Describe the composition of the sun, its relationship to other stars, and some other effects of its radiation on Earth's weather and communication. So as I told you, we figured out the composition of the sun by taking spectra of the light that it emits and figuring out what elements are glowing. And the answer to that is almost all hydrogen. Hydrogen is the first element on the periodic table. Uh, it's the simplest and lightest of the elements. It was almost all manufactured in the Big Bang and huge clouds of hydrogen were formed throughout the universe. Eventually gravity drew those clouds together and when enough gravity crushes that hydrogen into a ball, if there's enough of it and there's enough gravity, it eventually lights the force of fusion and fusion is when two hydrogen atoms are pushed together and make a helium, releasing energy. And that's almost all of the energy uh, that the sun makes is from fusing hydrogen. So the composition of the sun is hydrogen and its relationship to other stars uh, is we're all in the Milky Way. The other stars are like the sun. There are older stars, red stars, that have used up most of their hydrogen. and other large stars that are in the process of blowing up. Uh, and there are some stars that are so big that they can uh, fuse other uh, metals. The star, the Earth is actually quite complicated. It has various layers, as you can see in the diagram. Uh, the fusion happens in the center mostly, and that creates convection currents, and then there's rotation. And so all that stuff makes really complicated weather. Now, not weather like we have on the Earth, but like currents of convection and rotation and because the thing is rotating so fast, it makes a very strong magnetic field, uh, like a magnet in space spinning around. And those fields get tangled up as, as parts of the sun rotate around, and it causes sunspots. And when sunspots get connected in a certain way, it can cause solar Wait, flares or coronal mass ejections. And uh, so that is actually, the sun has uh, weather as well. So how does the sun affect the Earth's weather? Well, all of the weather on Earth, almost all of it, is because of the heat of the sun, right? The, the wind and the waves and all that stuff. Uh, the, the motion in our atmosphere, the, the, the weather fronts and all that, all that comes as a result of the heat from the sun. Uh, 
So effect on communications, when solar flares and stuff happen, uh, they can affect radio waves and uh, cell phones and stuff. And if we get a really big one, our telecom network's gonna be down for a little while. Uh, so yeah, so solar flares can affect radio communications on earth. 7B, define sunspots and describe some of the effects they may have on solar radiation. The definition of a sunspot, and actually we have an astrophysicist listening to me talk. He's probably groaning at my uh, inaccurate descriptions because they're uh, I'm giving summaries here. Uh, a sunspot is actually a, uh, a place where some magnetic lines have gotten tangled up and uh, the magnetic flow lines are different in those areas and they're a little bit cooler, um, the sunspots. And when there's a lot of sunspot activity, the sun is putting out more radiation of certain types and it can have an effect of increasing solar radiation, uh, which can actually affect radio communications here on earth. Uh, so let's see, C, um, a red star uh, gonna be- What were the effects again? What were the effects again? What is a solar flare? A solar flare is when a, a, a large burst of radiation shoots out from the sun. And so what was the um, 7B effects? What's the 7B effect? Uh, it can affect radio communications, can interrupt radio communications. Thank you. Uh huh. What if there's a solar flare? Are we doing, what are we doing, B? I just did B. 7B. Uh, I'm talking about D. With the aid of diagram, we explain the relative positions of the sun and moon at the times of lunar and solar eclipses. Uh, we're on seven. We already finished six, James. Wait, so what do I put down for that? So that was the last slide. You'll have to go back and use your merit badge book. That was the slide that showed the relative position of the moon, the sun, and the earth, and the phases of the moon. You're going back to number six. I'm on number seven now. Okay, and I will send you the link. You can rewatch it if you want, or if you want me to send you the slides, I'll be happy to do that, James. Okay, so 7C, red star. Uh, so a red star is a red, typically a red giant. Well, there's actually red dwarfs and red giants. Uh, the red stars that we see tend to be the bigger ones. So if you saw Arcturus overhead tonight or uh, Antares, those are definitely red stars. Uh, blue star, most of you saw Vega, so that's a good one. Um, yellow star, I don't know if I have an example of a yellow star. Is it, Orders, star, yellow star? it is. Okay. It is. It says other than the sun, though. Uh, explaining the meaning of these colors. Uh, well, red usually means cooler, blue usually means hotter, and yellow usually means young, uh, although that's a oversimplification of the lifetime of stars. But so red star, Antares big, cool, blue star, young, bright, uh, yellow star, middle-aged, burning hydrogen. And that's the meanings of those colors. And this stuff is in your merit badge book. So you should have the answers to 7C are fairly straightforward. All right. So uh, that gets us to the number eight and nine. Number eight is going to be our star party and our live viewing session. Uh, I think what we're going to do is we're going to skip ahead uh, to number nine because number eight is you're going to be doing B, plan and participate in an observation session, which we are doing tonight, which is going to include a telescope in a minute. So that's it for the slides. If you would like a copy of the slides, uh, email me or I'll post them on Google Docs or whatever. So uh, number Wait. nine is career opportunities. And so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to, uh, you may have noticed uh, a gentleman uh, in our Zoom by the name of Timothy Thompson. It's actually uh, really great for him to join us tonight. Did we identify, Timothy, did we identify at least one red star, one blue star? Do we have to do that somewhere else? Uh, I'm, I'm already done with that one. I'm going to keep going. Uh, if you need to look at the slides or review, we'll do some Q&A at the end. Uh, so we're going on to number nine now. Uh, so uh, joining us tonight is Timothy Thompson, 
who was, uh, or still is, an astrophysicist. Sorry, Tim. Uh, and he worked at JPL. I'll have him tell you a little bit of his background and how sort of his career worked out and maybe what some other possible careers might be. We're supposed to do three careers, Tim, including yours. So thank you for joining us, Tim. Tell us about what it was like to work <laughs> in this field. Well, um, in my background, you can all hear me, I assume. My background is in physics, my bachelor's and master's degree. And I got my job at JPL because my graduate advisor worked at JPL and told everybody I was brilliant, which was a lie, but it worked. <laughs> so most of my experience uh, was in the science data analysis end of the business, which you might call almost real astronomy. I modeled planetary atmospheres and I just did some studies of star formation and stellar physics. And, and I spent some time as a system manager for computer systems. It really helps to know a lot about computers if you're gonna get into any science. And even if you're not, it still helps to know a lot about computers. <clears throat> but the field of astronomy is just so incredibly broad that you can do like I did and get a degree in physics or astronomy, minor in physics, but you can get degrees in astronomy or astrophysics and be the science researcher who publishes papers or analyzes data. I don't have a doctoral degree. I was a technical staff person. I did a lot of, <clears throat> a lot of data anal analysis and I worked for other people who earned a lot of money through their grants and hired me because I knew what I was doing. But the big telescopes today weigh hundreds of tons and have to point with extreme precision. So there's a lot of opportunities for people you might not think of, like mechanical engineers who know how to build really big, heavy, stiff structures and move them around really carefully. Well, these big telescopes are amongst the most challenging projects you can get, like a high-speed aircraft or something for a mechanical engineer. So if you're inclined to do that kind of work, you can still get into engineering and just become a telescope engineer. Optical engineers, you saw I, somewhere along the line how the telescopes work, you know, reflectors, refractors. The modern telescopes can get pretty complicated. And if you're doing something which is, okay, not really astronomy, maybe like the gravitational wave detecting at LIGO, their mirrors and optical design are incredibly Mom, precise. can you grab me the book, please? Bond bouncing what amount to. Grab me the book, please. I need the book. They're bouncing what amounts to 100,000 watts of power off of a mirror, and it's going to melt if you don't make it right. Yeah. And computer programmers, software, camera instrument designers, people who do what's called applied physics or solid state physics, design cameras, like the camera that uh, the other Mr. Thompson showed you uh, a while ago. Well, those, uh, the big, fancy, expensive cameras, multi-million dollar cameras on the big telescopes require some pretty spiffy designs. So there are people who come at it from the instrument design side of the business. And you can even do what, what one enterprising character I knew did, who had a background in theater arts and a degree in English. And he wanted to hang out with astronomers, but he didn't have any of the science skills. He didn't know how to do it. So he got a job at JPL as a secretary. And since he had a background in English, he actually knew how to spell things, and it was was really great. Uh, he was an excellent secretary, and he hung around the astronomers and got to talk to them all the time. So you could even be an actor in a theater and get a job hanging around astronomers if that's what you really want. So lots of ways to get into astronomy, either as a professional career or uh, amateurs, just like I've done both myself and Mr. Other Mr. Thompson there is doing it. Spiffy job as an amateur astronomer. There are lots of ways to get into it. So I don't really know what else to tell you except to ask if you have 
questions, you know, ask me whatever's on your mind. I can't read the chats for whatever reason. I open it up and it's just, I can't see it. Okay. Well, uh, yeah. So yeah, what they're doing is they have to list three career opportunities and I think we gave them seven so they can write down any three of those. Uh, you started out with astronomical research, which was your own career. Uh, and I think you now, don't you have a, a position mm -hmm. up at Mount Wilson Observatory at this point? Like, I think you're still a tour guide up there, aren't you? Yes. So that would be- I'm, I'm the oldest, I'm the oldest surviving, I'm the second oldest surviving tour guide. I'm the one who's been there the longest for nearly 40 years. Uh, I'm also a session director, which means if people are observing through the telescope, I go there and manage the session and keep an eye on things. Uh, and I'm a member of the board of trustees of the Mount Wilson Institute, which uh, manages the observatory and the assets. And so I just, I, none of those are paid positions. Well, technically I could get paid for session directing, but I never submit an invoice anyway. So it's for my purposes, it's all volunteer. So guys, uh, for, your, for your requirement number nine, you can put down astronomical or astrophysical research. Tim mentioned mechanical engineer, which is a great career. Uh, optical engineer, which has to do with optics. There's all kinds of applied, both in astronomy and in other fields for optical engineering. Uh, instrumentation, uh, computer uh, or, or information technology is a whole career field involved in astronomy. Uh, I listed satellites and telecom. There's a lot of uh, careers involved in that. So pick any three of those and put them down. Uh, you're supposed to pick one that you're most interested in. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit about preparation here and then we'll be done with number nine. Uh, Tim talked a little bit about his own background. Yes, Carolyn. Okay, so I told the kids to type the questions into chat and okay. we will read them to Tim. So first question is, what is Mr. Thompson's college education background? That's for you, Tim. Well, I have bachelor's and master's degrees in physics. University of Los Angeles, which has a good physics department. Uh, and for what it's worth, I'm also a graduate of the Defense Language Institute for my days in the Air Force. And I passed the exit exam in French and Russian. I suppose you could say that foreign languages are not a requirement to do astronomy, but I cooperated with teams in France, Sweden, Japan, from all over the world. And it certainly helps if you're multilingual to be able to talk to people you know, in their own language occasionally. It, 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 the people to people thing is real in all careers, in all fields, and it can only help you. Yep, I think also for the, uh, uh, at least at the point you guys are, you know, uh, approaching or in high school and maybe headed on to college, I would certainly, uh, the computer and math skills, like in all of those fields, those are gonna be preparatory, all those different possibilities Tim mentioned. Uh, maybe even for uh, being an actor or English, you would need some math skills if you were gonna work at a, a job that was related. But I, secretaries today have to be smarter computer people than the people they work for. So you can't, you, you can't get away from the computers these days. Uh, so yeah, I mean, physics, math, computers, these are all areas that would be prepared. We have another question here, Carolyn, what is it? Oh, uh, Byron's asking, what types of jobs did Tim do? Okay, uh, Tim, I believe at JPL, what was your actual title at JPL? What did you do? My title changed around a little bit, and nobody was altogether sure. I once asked what... They called me a member of the technical staff, but when I asked my boss, you know, isn't there something better? So yeah, you can call yourself a research assistant. But when I went into the terrestrial sciences element, uh, my element leader said, we should change you to software engineer because they're leaving the lab. And if we change your job classification, they'll give you a pay raise so that you won't leave which I wasn't going to do anyway, but we did that and, and it worked. They gave, raised my pay immediately, but I was a software engineer. And so technically my title was software engineer because it made me more money. <laughs> but 
But what I actually did was a lot of computer programming, specifically to analyze data from planetary atmospheres and imagery from instruments like the Spitzer Space Telescope, which was the last big project I worked on. So that's an analyzing data coming from instruments uh, and actually figuring out what what atmospheres exist on remote planets. It's a, a pretty astronomy related series of tasks to do in those days, I think. A, pretty, a lot of physics and math, I guess, Tim. A lot of physics, a lot of math, and you must remember that the computers are so very different now than they were when I started. We didn't have digital readouts. We had strip charts with pens on them like the seismographs. And when I went out to Goldstone and we looked at Jupiter, we watched the paper scroll out of the machine and looked for the wiggles on the ink line. And <laughs> the data was recorded on magnetic tape. We couldn't see it for days. They had to ship us the magnetic tapes. and so now you see everything happens in seconds right in front of you. You guys right, had terabytes of data instantly, right? Okay. Well, thank you yeah. for sharing, Tim. Uh, I think some people are asking, like, what kind of training do you need? And I think, uh, you know, the things we've mentioned, uh, there are different career possibilities, but uh, computers, a good basis in math, uh, perhaps some physics or science courses, both uh, in high school and in college. Uh, these are setting the stage for all these careers, depending on what you're interested in. Uh, I think someone said an astronaut, you'll find that most astronauts these days have a very similar career path starting out in high school, uh, where computers, math, and sciences form the core uh, that is gonna be expected of an astronaut. There are some other things involved in being an astronaut, and you have to get in some special training programs typically uh, through defense contractors or the military. Uh, and if I could get you an astronaut on here, I would, but uh, we got an astrophysicist, which is pretty cool. So thank you, Tim. We have uh, 30 minutes remaining. Yeah. One last question. What yeah. inspired Mr. Thompson to go into the astronomy astrophysics? All right, well, what inspired you, Tim? What inspired me? Well, it's a long story. <laughs> uh, I actually started out as a philosopher and I decided that wasn't for me because it was, I found it to be an undisciplined field. <laughs> and so, uh, but I went from there to mathematics because mathematicians are disciplined in a way philosophers are not, but mathematicians have no use for reality. It's, it's totally meaningless to a mathematician. It does nothing but logical relations. That wasn't for me either, but physics, is in my mind the ultimate applied mathematics because now you're dealing with reality, harsh reality <laughs> in a very real way, but with the rigor of mathematics. And I got into astronomy and astrophysics partly because my older brother did the same thing as an observational astronomer at Lowell Observatory. And if any of you have an older brother, you know you can't let them do something you don't do. That's just not allowed, right? And so <laughs> naturally, I did it too. But astrophysics in particular is a field that uses everything you learn in physics. It uses quantum mechanics, thermodynamics, electromagnetism, solid state physics, Newtonian mechanics. You can't think of a field in physics that doesn't wind up getting used in astrophysics. And I can't see spending the rest of my life staring at a Josephson junction through a magnifying glass to figure out how it works. Uh, I'm not that kind of guy. But there are people who do that and like it, and good for them because they build these computers that we're using, but I'm not one of them. So I got into the field where I could do everything. Okay. And I did. So that's a, that's a pretty good answer. Uh, there are certain similarities, but I, I ended up doing more math and, and philosophy. So, uh, but I got interested in astronomy too. So a little bit unhinged, uh, but <laughs> with, some, with some knowledge in the real world. So I do want to allow us time, guys. Our remaining time is going to be live viewing through a telescope. This is going to be your star party for requirement 8B. And so you're going to keep a few notes. Uh, Spencer's going to come back online here. And uh, hopefully we're going to be able to get a live view 
Uh, so you should be able to see the planets through a telescope and what it would be like to actually be there looking through the eyepiece. So keep notes for 8B on what we see. Um, uh, Spencer, are you still with us? Are you guys able to hear me? Yes. Cool. Okay, great. Yes. great. All right, so um, Murphy's Law, uh, one of my telescopes we can't hear you. Interesting. So, but the, the, on the plus side, Jupiter and Saturn. Let's do a screen share. Uh, let me share the screen. Yep. Hopefully, we'll we'll see that. That would be good. Okay. Uh, let's see. Can I uh, let's see? Can you let me share? Yeah, you should have the green button available, Carolyn. Are they allowed to share? Yeah. Can you guys let me share the screen? I can't share right now. Oh, that wasn't supposed to happen. Okay, here we go. Good. I got it. All right. Does anybody recognize this? Are you guys able to see this? Yeah, that's nice. I'm sure okay. the students can recognize that. They better. It's kind of blurry because it's still kind of low on the horizon. But uh, that's Saturn. And uh, let me see. Let me see if we can't get a better, slightly better view of that one. <laughs> Wait, so how are something. we going to, how do we do 8B? We look. Yeah, so the first, like, 8B, you're going to put down Saw Saturn. And what feature of Saturn, Gregory, did you see? Uh, the brownish color and the rings. Yeah, I think the, the main feature that we're seeing right now is the rings. Um, now the brownish color. Yeah, so right now Saturn is just rising tonight. Um, so it's close to the horizon. What Spencer means is, when something's close to the horizon, it has to pass through more atmosphere and it's blurrier. As things rise up higher in the sky, there's less air to look through and it gets clearer. So right now we're, we're able to see enough of Saturn to see the rings. I don't think we're seeing much other features. You can see the central planet itself there. Yeah. Okay, so let me just, uh, hang on one second. Yeah. My camera's freezing on me for one second. Just a second here. I just kicked the cable loose. That's what happens. So let me reconnect the cable. Okay. Yeah, I, and we're going to do some viewing. Okay. And actually here in LA, uh, it looks like someone found the comet. So as we end our session in the next 30 minutes, if you want to head outside and make a try for the comet, you probably will need binoculars. So if you don't have binoculars, you probably won't see it. Uh, but right now, uh, Jupiter and Saturn are above the Eastern horizon. Um, so hopefully if you guys know where Polaris is, you face towards the mountains basically, and that's North. On your right-hand side will be East. That's gonna be where Jupiter and Saturn are. On your left-hand side to the west, uh, you're gonna see uh, where the sun went down. And over towards that direction, below uh, the Big Dipper is uh, actually where that comet is right now. It's a little hard to see because I think it's already past the Earth's orbit, so it's kind of headed out right now. Uh, but it was pretty bright. Uh, it went around the sun, came back, it was bright, uh, like Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, and had a beautiful twin tail. Uh, it's still there, uh, so if you get a chance to see it the next couple nights, uh, you'll need a pair of binoculars. But that's a cool sight. Um, okay, so I'm going to show Jupiter now. This All is, right. uh, hopefully we're going to see two views of Jupiter. Let's see, bear with me. Okay, 
share. All right. Do you see Jupiter? Yes, we do. And we see some extra things. Yeah. That and you've got, so I've got the gain cranked up really high so you can see the moon. So you should be able to see four moons there. I see three. Actually, there's probably a fourth one. Just let me just move it up just a tad. Okay, yeah, you're right. There are three. I saw four earlier tonight. There are only three. But uh, now the, the problem is that uh, in order to see the moon, I had to crank the gain up high. So Jupiter is washed out so you can see the moon. But if I crank the gain down a little bit, or, you know, so, the, so it's less sensitive. Uh, you can sort of see some color. You can sort of see the bands on Jupiter. Let me just yeah, I see move my magnifier. Thing, yeah. Why is Jupiter okay. blue? Uh, I've got a filter on there that blocks out a lot of the light pollution. And so, it, so what it does is it shifts the color spectrum. So basically it's a filter that selectively blocks out the sodium and mercury vapor lights. Okay. And so it, the byproduct is uh, it shifts everything to blue. And you're seeing one of, the, one of the problems I'm having with my telescope right now, which is it's slowly drifting out of the view. So now let's see if we can't get Jupiter in a higher magnification on a different type of telescope. Okay, so we saw Saturn and we saw Jupiter. Um, I think for your notes on 8B uh, class, I want you to be sure that you listed the moons of Jupiter. That's a remarkable sight that you can only see through a telescope. If you'll remember from earlier in the lecture, uh, who can remember who was the first person to see the moons of Jupiter? Galileo. Nice. That's correct. Do you remember why? Because he was the first person to have a telescope. A that's right. That's right. Um, so uh, you know that the moon, our, the, the, the moon of the Earth, goes around and around the Earth, right? So when Galileo first looked at Jupiter, he saw the moons of Jupiter. There's four of them you can see in a telescope or, or an ordinary telescope. And then he looked the next night and they were in a different position. He looked the next night and they were in a different position. And he realized that the little dots in a line around Jupiter, they have to be moons and they're going around and around Jupiter. That was a great science finding of the 17th century. No one imagined that other planets had moons. They thought, you know, what, Jupiter. What type of telescope are you using? Uh, I believe Spencer showed us earlier, James, it's a catadioptric, which is the uh, hybrid one that has a mirror and a, a, a lens. Remember, he showed us a picture of that telescope. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't think Mars is going to be up unless you're allowed to stay up past your bedtime. Uh, but if you're, uh, if you're up a little bit later, Mars will rise in the same place that Jupiter rose. And it'll be in line with uh, Jupiter and Saturn, and it'll be a kind of dusky orange red color. Um, but it won't be up for, I think, another hour or two. Yeah, it came up around midnight, I think. Oh, later That's than even thought, yeah. I'm up late sometimes. So I saw, I saw Mars like over the weekend when I was up late. The, uh, okay, we, went up to, so. we went up to Ford Observatory to see the comet, and we got some great views. Uh, that was uh, last Saturday night. Uh, so uh, someone just asked if we can see the moon. The answer is no. It's set. it's set, so it's behind the Earth right now. Okay, are you guys able to share this? See the screen? Yeah, we see the screen okay, but there's nothing in okay. the uh, software view right now. Hang on, just a second. So um, as we approach the end of our class. Uh, we're doing our observing, and Spencer is actually doing some pretty technical stuff with his camera and the software to provide these live views for you. Okay, are you able to see that one now? Oh, yeah, that's really bright. Okay. Now, okay, so it's really highly magnified, and yeah. I'm starting to bring in... Uh, 
Yeah, I, I saw some banding Decreasing there. Decreasing the sensitivity. So you, there it is. Okay, there you go. You see okay. that? Awesome. Beautiful. Is the red spot not there? Are you guys able to see that? Yeah, yeah, we're able to see it really well. Hey, Spencer, could you explain why? What is it? No, I see. I think that's a great red spot, right? Yeah. It looks like that to me. That's what it looks like to me, too. Uh, Spencer, could you describe why Jupiter appears to be moving around and changing shape? Sure. Uh, you're going to, you're looking, I think the way to think of it is, uh, look, you have a glass of water, and you, uh, you're you looking through the glass, and you have, uh, you touch the water, you have ripples, right? And so you're seeing the ripples uh, distort the image. So what's happening is Jupiter's coming through. Right now, Jupiter is still fairly low on the horizon. It's getting up there, but uh, it's going through a lot of atmosphere. And so the atmosphere is just moving. There's turbulence in the atmosphere. And so as the light goes through the, uh, through the layers of the atmosphere, uh, the, it refracts, ref, refracts the light. And so it bends it. And so it bends it in random fashion. So that's why you see it wavering and shimmering like that. So it's not Jupiter. Same idea it's, behind. It's the atmosphere pardon? that we're looking yeah. through, right? Yeah, exactly. It's same idea behind uh, stars twinkling. You know, stars twinkling because the light's going through the atmosphere. So in this case, uh, with the star, it's a single point of light. But with Jupiter, it's a large object. And so you're just seeing a lot of the, uh, the waving pattern. So let's see. Now can, with, anyone, can anyone in the class think of a telescope that, that doesn't have this problem, that doesn't have uh, uh, problems with the atmosphere. We, I showed you a picture of it at my Hubble. presentation. Hubble. That's correct, that's correct. The Hubble Space Telescope is above our atmosphere, so it can take very clear pictures, not subject to the, uh, this, this thing. Also, and I know this is something Tim knows about, there's a reason that they build the world's best observatories on top of the world's highest mountains, because the higher you go up in altitude, the less atmosphere you're pointed through. So even just going up to Mount Wilson above Pasadena, which I think is above 5,000 feet, it's much better than being down here in the city. And if you go to the, uh, some of the observatories now in Chile, uh, Mauna Kea is at like 14,000 feet, I think. Mauna Kea is 14,000 feet. I've been there. Not only do you have less air to look through, you have less air to breathe, and that actually <laughs> becomes important. You, you do have to worry about that. Uh, well, so yeah, so the modern telescopes, the, you know, the astronomers want them as high up as possible, and Tim's right. If you go up to 14,000 feet to do your research, you need to you'd be in pretty good shape and be kind of careful because there's not a lot of oxygen up there. All right. Uh, so uh, anyway, for your uh, your star party notes, um, you know, you've seen the moons of Jupiter, you've seen the rings of Saturn, you've seen the great red spot and the stripes on Jupiter. So these are just the notes for what did you observe. Uh, and also earlier when you went out on your own and spotted Vega and some other things you can put down. So uh, we're gonna stay on till 10 o'clock or a few minutes after for those of you that have questions. Um, Spencer, did you want to try and go to a different object? Uh, to sort of yeah, I'm going to try and go to Alberio, a double star. So, uh, okay, and I'm totally going to let uh, a Tim describe what the colors mean because I'm if I blow it again, <laughs> I'm going to lose face in the club. Well, you had it right. Uh, basically, the blue means a hot, high temperature, and the uh, red is a cooler temperature. So why, yeah. hey Tim, why are there red dwarfs and red giants? Why are some red stars tiny and some red stars huge? The fact that that's true was actually discovered at Mott Wilson Observatory, by the way, but <laughs> yeah, the small ones are, are really little. In fact, the smallest red dwarf stars are much the same size as Jupiter is. And they're very small, and because they have very low mass, they have very low core temperatures, and so they're red because of their intrinsic size. The giants are huge stars that have extremely hot cores, 
but the thermodynamics forces the atmosphere to expand to balance the uh, radiation pressure from inside the star. And so the surface of the star is very cool because it's extremely bloated and sparse. And so it's cool on the outer envelope, but if you went inside a red giant star, it would be super hot. You'd have billion degree temperatures in the core of one of those stars where you'd barely make, you know, 10 million kelvins in uh, in a small dwarf star. But okay, I, I, I want to make a couple questions, couple questions in chat. One, uh, in, in Byron, you don't have to do, uh, you only have to do 8B. That's the do one of requirements. So C, D, and E, you don't have to do all those. We're just going to do B. And that's going to be ours. Uh, the other question is, what substance in the suns produce the red, blue, or yellow color? So I was talking about spectrum, and yet we have different colored stars. What do, what do these different colors represent for what they're made out of, Tim? The different colors of the stars, if you just look at the brightness and color of the star, like with your eyeball or with a simple camera, and you don't do spectroscopy, it's dominated by temperature. There are a few instances where that's not the case, but it's almost always temperature. When you're doing spectroscopy, each element has its own absorption and in some stars emission lines. And then you have to look at the spectrum and you can see almost every element that's in the periodic table in stars like the sun. It's certainly every element, uh, well, lots of elements, most of the non-radioactive elements and even some of the radioactive ones you can see in the sun. And it looks like Spencer has Alberio. Yeah, so Spencer's yeah I have Alberio. So, uh, could you, so could this you is, see this with your naked eye, Spencer? You, yeah, you can see it with your naked eye, but it only looks like just one star. So you really need a telescope to resolve it into two stars. And so, in fact, I'm looking at it right now. Uh, I can see it. I, fortunately, I uh, have a, lot, a little less light pollution than you do where you live. So, um, but I'm able to see it. Uh, the neb and I can see Alberio uh, fairly clearly. Uh, you can see that it's drifting slowly down off the screen. That's uh, that's my telescope not behaving. So I'm going to have to tear some things apart tomorrow and figure out what's going on. But and that's why I'm not going after some of the uh, one of the things that I try to sky objects. But let me just put the mag let me put the magnifier on there so you okay. can see a better close up. Yeah, I mean what we're seeing here is a double star and they're like they're they're different colors just looking at them I mean, most people look at the night sky and they think oh all those things are the same color and those of us that do astronomy go oh no there's all different kinds of colors in the night sky and that's a pretty good example of a double star um and i'll i'll take a crack at double star there are a lot of star systems in fact a large percentage of them we think now where they're not just one stars in a solar system but there's essentially two where the two stars rotate or orbit each other. Uh, and this appears to be more common than we might have thought, uh, where we, we, in our solar system, there's just one star, but a great number of star systems might have two or even three or four stars all orbiting each other in some pattern. Uh, but Al Alberio here is a double star, and there, in some cases, the two stars in a double star, they might be you know, fairly similar. But in other cases, they might be really different. And that's the case with Alberio here. You can tell from the size and the color difference that the two stars are not the same. Uh, so question, which one's hotter? That's a good question. We, we, we taught that. What, is, what does blue mean? It's big and young. That's right, that's right. Uh, in this case, uh, the, the blue star is probably the hotter star. Someone typed in a question about black holes, which is a great question here at the end. You know, black holes, uh, we just imaged the, the first black hole or actually the, the system around it. Uh, uh, when I say we, I mean the human race, not, not me and Spencer, because <laughs> it's really far away and requires a whole bunch of data. But yeah, so, you know, as stars get bigger and bigger, the force of gravity you know, crushes the star, you know, with greater gravity in the center. So eventually stars can actually fuse uh, 
uh, hydrogen into helium, then like helium into lithium and carbon. Helium into carbon. Yeah, lithium carbon into carbon. And oxygen and all the way up to iron. All the way up to iron. So as gravity gets bigger and bigger, it, it eventually when it reaches iron, if you if you fuse iron, you don't get any sunshine out. There's no energy that really comes out. But you the star can keep collapsing if it's big enough, and it, you reach a certain point where the resistance of the matter to the power of the gravity it can't hold up anymore, and the whole thing collapses into itself. And we just call it a black hole because we don't know what's in there. We have no no real idea. It's a it's a gravitational hole in the universe. Uh, light, uh, the gravity is so powerful that light can't even escape it, which is why we sort of say black. Uh, it just means no, no, nothing comes out of here. Now, things that orbit a black hole orbit at really, really high speeds, and that can heat them up. So we can actually see some of the radiation from around black holes, but nothing from the black hole itself. And again, black hole is one of those astronomical terms for something that we know exists, but we don't, re we know some of its properties and, and we've measured how they work. But if you said, well, what's inside a black hole? You, the answer is kind of like, uh, yeah, a, a, a hole in the, you know, it's a gravitational hole in space. We don't really know and we never will because any instrument that you flew into a black hole Crush. would be crushed and would never be able to communicate with you because nothing can escape a black hole, uh, even light. Uh, um, so, uh, yeah, so two black holes, when they crash into each other, uh, it actually, uh, I'm glad you mentioned that. You're kind of correct, it makes two black holes, but it's a really complicated process because as they approach each other, their motion, like a skater, gets faster and faster. They're orbiting each other super, super fast, and they're super, super heavy. So actually that rotation and the gravitational effects, like if you put your hand in water and you pushed it forward and back, it would make a wave through the water, right? Well, black holes orbiting each other uh, as they approach each other create gravity waves. And only in the last couple of years have we built a detector called the LIGO detector. They actually measured two black holes or a neutron star in a black hole, I forget which, collapsing into each other and like like ripples in a pond space itself was warped uh in these waves and they measured it so uh once they do combine they do form into two black holes they do combine a black hole and i think someone answered that question but the process itself is quite complicated and interesting and a topic of current research because it's if you think about it all of like radio waves and x-rays and visible light and ultraviolet like that's all electromagnetic radiation that we use our instruments gravity waves are a whole new way to look at the universe that no one has ever done so in essence it's kind of like galileo all over again these guys have invented a way to observe the universe in a whole new way and the first things they're able to measure are the black holes collapsing into each other and and also neutron stars Okay, Spencer, there was a request. Uh, could you find uh, Comet Neowise? Hey, Spencer, can you hear us? I'm sorry, say that again. I didn't hear that. Uh, uh, a request if you could find Comet Neowise. Comet Neowise, uh, right now it's 10 o'clock. It has set behind some trees. The optimal time to see it from here was about uh, between 9.15 and 9.45. Uh, so it's, uh, I'm looking out and I can kind of see if I really squint and use my part of his tail coming up from behind a couple of, uh, couple of trees. But uh, get to see it, do so, it is spectacular. I went out to uh, our Lockwood Valley site on Sunday, uh, Monday night, and saw it there, and it was just gorgeous. You could see a naked eye visibility. I think it looks a lot so, better yeah, unfortunately, with binoculars. Uh, this is a bad place to see it from. 
Yeah, yeah. on Saturday I'm night, the better interview was just amazing. I really, I could see both tails. It was really cool. Yeah. Talking, I was going to try and get to uh, to uh, Alter. I mean, sir, and Terry's. Oh, and Terry's over in Scorpio. Yeah, we were trying looking yeah. for that earlier when we went outside. Okay. Hang on, I'm gonna hang on, I'm gonna close this program for a second and start it up again. Okay. So it's coming up on ten o'clock. Um, I'm gonna stay here an extra ten minutes uh, because I know some of you are getting ready to wind down or finish up your packet or ask a question. Uh, the live viewing session. If Spencer can get something else up in the next few minutes, we can take a look at that as well. So, um, the question for Greg, uh, from Gregory Ann Can we only draw moons for six feet? Yeah, I typed in, okay, I have Aunt Terry's on here. Uh, I can't hear you. Right. Go ahead. Okay, so um, let me just magnify it a little bit. Uh, and you're not sharing right now, Spencer. Oh, sorry. Okay, let me just share yeah. it. Okay, here we go. All right. Now, normally looking at stars is kind of, yeah, is they're kind of uh, uninteresting, or at least I find it to be. But and Terry's see the color. Here, yeah. So you're seeing a lot of the distortion caused by the atmosphere, and like I said, most of the time I don't like to look at stars because they're just kind of boring. But that's in Terry's, so you can put that down in your list of things that you saw through telescope, I guess. All right, so I'm I'm gonna have to do some troubleshooting. I can't figure out why my my stuff is. It was so solid for so such a long time. Oh, and suddenly tonight it decides to act up. Okay, well, we're, our next class is until August, so you have some time. Thank you so much for sharing okay. our, our telescope and also uh, the objects we were able to see. Um, uh, the students uh, were were essentially done at this point. Uh, we've covered every requirement, um, either the prereq or the answers. Uh, I will stay on an extra 10 minutes uh, in case anyone wants to type any questions. Uh, and I hope all of you can finish your packet and email me uh, your worksheet and your pictures so that I can sign you off a blue card. And thank you for joining us for these three hours. We're happy to share all of our stuff with astronomy. Please thank Spencer and, uh, uh, and Tim for joining us to help us out do this. Uh, Carolyn, my wife, there's a big effort to put it together. We really appreciate everyone working to help these scouts see all this cool stuff and, and earn a badge along the way. So thanks a lot. Thank you. All right. Okay, good night. Good night. Good night.